this is something that I take very seriously and pretty passionate about. But I will say that I'm not at all a plant person. I mean, I like plants. I like gardening. I, I have a garden. Um, but I'm, I'm a zoologist. I'm a trained zoologist. And, you know, animals interact with plants. I've been meaning to study the, the actual known effects of light pollution on plants for a year now. Um, I even have studies on it, and I haven't really dipped into the literature. So this was a great, fun uh, excuse for me to really dig into the effects of light pollution on plants. Uh, and I'm going to share that with you today. So I will say we're going to go into some pretty hardcore science stuff at the beginning that I'm not really an expert on. I, mean, I, I just read papers and tried to figure it out. Some of you probably are better experts on it than I am. Um, so if there are some issues, please you know, write in the chat uh, and excuse me for it. I'm a, I'm a zoologist. Okay, right, so let's see, there we go. Are we getting it? Oh, okay, looks like I have to click. All right, so just some quick affiliations and plugs. Yeah, so I, I've been living in St. Louis now for about a year. I started um, with a Living Earth Collaborative, which is out of uh, Washington University, the uh, Botanical Garden and the St. Louis Zoo, with also affiliations across St. Louis and probably about 20 or 30 different entities. Um, and it's all about understanding biodiversity and conservation or conserving that biodiversity. Uh, the main reason I think I got hooked up here is through the uh, International Dark Sky Association, the Missouri chapter. So the International Dark Sky Association is a wonderful conservation entity protecting the natural night skies, especially protecting the resource that is natural night. Um, also, so please check this out. Please check out Dark Sky Missouri if you're at all interested in any kind of lighting at night uh, that's going around your area, or if you are an astronomer, an amateur astronomer, um, or if you just think, and perhaps hopefully after this talk, you'll think, oh boy, we really need to do something about this light pollution. It's not just, you know, it's not just affecting astronomers being able to measure the sky, but it's also affecting um, my garden. So check that out, darkskymissouri.org, or just check out IDA as well. Um, I'm also, so again, I'm a zoologist, so I'm also in, involved in the Zoological Lighting Institute, which focuses on um, natural lighting and bringing that to zoos and aquarium, uh, aquaria for animal welfare. And then how I got started in all of this, my first postdoc was actually with the National Park Service with the uh, Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division, where I was studying the effects of light pollution on moths and other animals in Colorado. All right, so there we go. Now, with all that being said, again, plants, um, not my uh, forte, more animals. But this, is, this will be fun. So where are we going to go today? Well, we're going to first talk about what is light. That I do know. So talk about light. And then we're going to talk about light and plants and how um, plants are so dependent upon the information and energy from light, which you probably already know. But we're going to get into the real specifics. And then we're going to talk about artificial light at night. I was introduced what that is, or Allen, as we call it in the field. And then Allen and plants, plants and animals under Allen, and then solutions to Allen. Um, I, don't, I don't have time to really go into my current research that's investigating the effects of plants and animals under Allen. Um, it's, it's pretty intense stuff, so I thought this would be more fun just to give you a broad overview than to go in the very specifics of my research agenda that focuses on plants and animals. But I'm happy to give that talk another time. All right, so let's first start off with what is light? Well, light's part, well, at the end of the day, we don't really know what light is, uh, but it is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And for us, it's the visible part. So it's where our eyes can actually measure the electromagnetic spectrum. It's important to point out that for us, we have, hopefully you can see my mouse here. So we have visibility just below 400 nanometers, which gives us that, that violet and then blue. Green is around 500, 600 is orange, and then red and deep red around 700 nanometers. And then we have infrared, which we can't see, uh, and that's mostly heat. So that's important to know that there's different, based on what wavelengths of light or the part of the electromagnetic spectrum, that's the color that we see. Uh, to make things a little more confusing, sometimes you can have, let's say, blue light and red light present, and that would give you like a purple um, perception. Also, to make light very confusing. It's both a particle and a wave, which in classic physics is not possible. So we're already breaking the rules of classical physics. Um, but sometimes, especially when you're a biologist and you're studying light, sometimes you need to think about it as a particle, which is basically, 
you know, how much light is hitting a surface you think about it as a particle, kind of just like, uh, I don't know, balls hitting a roof, right? Whereas a wave, you need to think about um, light as a wave when you start thinking about color perception. What, what wavelength are you perceiving? So we use, I basically think of particles and waves uh, interchangeably when it comes to light, biological impacts of light. All right, so going with that, specifically the particle and wave duality, uh, these figures down at the bottom here, these are different spectra for well, daylight, incandescent light bulbs, and fluorescent light bulbs. And what this shows is that even though we perceive the, the ambient light environment for daylight, incandescent, fluorescent about the same, you can actually have very different light present uh, and still have the same effects. So these are color coded right across the spectrum. Daylight is very broad band. It has all wavelengths of the visible light spectrum. Incandescent, however, does have that warm hue to it. You know, it's still mostly perceived as white, but you can see that the red, the red part of the spectrum is much more intense than the blue. And then fluorescent, although it looks white to us, is not at all white. It just has a few peaks, and these peaks match our actual visual system, right? The RGB, the red, green, blue cones, and that tells our brain that it's white, even though this is not white light. White light should be straight across. All right, something to keep in mind, because we're going to be talking about this throughout the rest of the talk. And really, this, this whole talk is about light and about how biology uses the light. Okay, so... We can talk quickly about the physics of light. Now you know everything there is to know about that. Uh, let's also talk about just the natural lighting that we have on this planet due to celestial bodies, mostly our sun. Um, natural ambient lighting varies across nine orders of magnitude, right? So it's a billion times different in intensity during the day compared to starlight um, with no clouds. It's a billion times brighter at night. That's a huge variation. And that, and if you can, Key into, if you can cue into that, if you can cue into that intensity difference of light levels, you actually have a really great sense of information um, that can be very important for biological functions. Now, of course, the biggest change is during twilight, which can be broken into three different groups, not too important, but just know that during the day, it's pretty consistent. And at night, if it's starlight, it's pretty consistent. And then civil twilight, it changes about eight orders of magnitude. Or sorry, twilight changes eight orders of magnitude across astronom astronomical, nautical, and civil. At night, though, depending on the lunar phase, you can actually get another four orders of magnitude difference just based on whether it's full moon down the new moon and how high in the sky the, the moon is. This is really important when thinking about animal behavior because so many animals will wait for specific lunar phases to do an activity. For instance, a lot of rodents will not go out and forage until they have new moon conditions, which only happens about 50% of the night. Because um, if the moon's below the horizon, then it's still new moon condition, right? So this is really important to think about because a lot of animals basically are dictated um, of when they can go out. Otherwise, they can get eaten by an owl. We know that owls forage much more under full moon conditions than they do new moon conditions. So this is really important to keep in mind. Is it that important for plants? I don't know. No one's really investigated the different lunar phase uh, light levels, as far as I can tell. Perhaps you know something, and I'd love to hear about that in the chats. Um, all right. So we have intensity as a change across a billion times. We also have the spectra uh, changes throughout the day. So daylight, as we already talked about briefly, right, is relatively wide across the electromagnetic spectrum with very little in the, the UV, but it bumps up pretty quick. Uh, in the ultraviolet, violet, and blue. That changes drastically as the sun starts to get close to the horizon or furthermore under the horizon just by a few degrees, you actually have these twilight conditions that are very purple. Remember that I was saying purple is comprised of blue and red. And we have this big dip in green and yellow. So the twilight color, or as you know, some people call like, I think it's called purple sky, um, you have very different wavelengths present than you do during daylight. And then at night, under starlight conditions, it's very, very orange and yellow. So we have at least three different uh, colors of light environments based on the day as well. And then lastly, the duration of light throughout the 24 hour period changes due to seasonality. So depending on how high or how low you are in um, latitude, so if you're, you know, 
close to the North Pole or close to the South Pole, you're going to have huge changes in your photo period. And this is what this figure on the right is showing, is that on the equator, which is this purple zero degree north line right here, the, it's always 12 hours day and it's always 12 hours night. However, as you start to go up north, and this would be the same as if you started to go south, you would have, um, so yeah, like 10 degrees, right? You're changing a little bit, about an hour, two hours difference throughout the year uh, of day length, all the way up to 60 degrees north, where during the summer, it's 18 hours day, kind of, you know, like what we're being, what we're experiencing now. Uh, and then during the winter, it's only four hours of daylight. So this is a big, this is, this is a huge piece of information just due to the earth's tilt that we're able to understand. And by we're, I mean, any kind of life that's able to detect light can cue into this and know, okay, there's changing seasons. Um, and of course, temperature also plays a role in this, but light is a very big factor in understanding seasonality, especially for plants and animals. All right, so in summary, light, right? It's electromagnetic radiation consisting of waves and particles. It has an intensity and spectrum, um, and these differ based on the source and also the time of day. Uh, and the duration of daylight varies depending on latitude and season. This is really important because plants and animals have evolved under these consistent light regimes for over a billion years, right? The first um, algae and bacteria that you could actually harvest light, uh, they've been around for over a billion years, and these cycles have stayed pretty much constant. Okay, oh yeah, there we go. That was supposed to help me go through there. All right, so again, yep, electromagnetic radiation, intensity and spectrum, um, different colors based on the day, and then due to the tilt, we have different duration of daylight. All right, I wanna start off, I, this is as far back as I could find um, scientists or any kind of publication of the effects of light on plants. And I mean the, the color of light. So Robert Hunt in 1844 published this, um, and I know Darwin was playing around with lights and plants around this time, but this seems like the first time to really see that different colored plants affect the growth, or sorry, different colored lights affect the growth of plants. Uh, so in Robert Hunt's book, Researches on Light, he found that, he didn't know why, but that red light on a plant would increase flowering and blue light would decrease flowering but increase germination. And this then, you know, of course was studied right away, but the actual mechanisms behind it uh, lay dormant for over a hundred years. And in fact, it wasn't until the 1990s that we really understood what was going on at the molecular level um, and the physiological level within plants to explain what Hunt was discovering here with red light leading to flowering and blue light leading to germination. So at the end of the day, what Hunt's observations showed is that there is this molecule, that's a photopigment, um, that is being affected by different colors of light. So different wavelengths of light are going to be affecting these photopigments. And uh, here's just a photopigment right now. We'll talk about more specifically in a second. But what's cool about it is you have two different shapes, as you can see here, two different, yeah, two different forms of the same molecule. And when it hits, when it's hit by a photon, one little discrete package of light, it changes shape. And then that change in shape leads to huge cellular cascades, right? So you have this photon, this little red photon that goes through, and then all of these other cascades chemically are happening that leads to all of these changes in plants and, and animals, depending on which photosystem you're talking about. Um, now, here's the thing. It's not just one type of molecule. There are, in fact, a lot of different molecules that interact with light. And so that allows plants to basically have more or less of a vision where they're able to have, catch blue light and not catch red light or catch red light and not catch blue light. So here are just several different pigments in plants are actually more than this. Uh, but this shows the absorption, meaning that, for instance, in chlorophyll B here, this green line, if a photon has a wavelength around 450, it's very likely to be absorbed. But it won't be absorbed if it has a wavelength less than 400 because there's no absorbance in that, in, um, in that molecule. Uh, and the same goes, right, so for, I don't know, chlorophyll 
A has a longer peak over here where it would be absor absorbing. Um, and of course, you guys know chlorophyll is used for photosynthesis, and it ha it's both, it absorbs in the blue and absorbs in the red, which is why leaves are green, because they're reflecting the green light and absorbing the blue and the red. All right. So hopefully that quickly shows that plants are able to absorb these light photons of different wavelengths and have different responses. As Robert Hunt showed in the 1840s, you could have under red light, you can have um, flowers, and then under blue light, you can have germination. These are huge differences. So what's going on there? And again, a lot of research focused in the uh, 1900s on these different photoreceptors in plants. As of right now, what we know of is there are four different types of photoreceptors in plants. You have phytochromes, cryptochromes, phototropins, and for some reason, whoever named the last one didn't care about Latin uh, or couldn't be bothered coming up with a Latin name and gave it FKF1. Um, I don't know. I don't know why. It's clearly a, a specific gene. Um, I like phytochromes, cryptochromes, phototropins because they more or less tell you uh, what's going on, right? Phyto plant and chrome is for color. Cryptochromes are actually named because they're really difficult. They named it when they finally discovered it because they were so cryptic to find like what was actually going on. And then phototropins, um, this has to do with the actual behavior of plants to light or photo. Cool. So let's dive into these for a little bit. All right. And again, I know this is very science heavy at the beginning. We'll, we'll kind of um, zoom out later, but I think it's really important to understand the actual physiology in plants so that we can start to predict and understand how artificial light at night is going to have an effect on them. So shedding light onto Hunt's experiments with these photoreceptors, uh, one of the main types is phytochromes, and these absorb in the, the red light. Now there's two main types of phytochromes. There's PR and there's PFR. PR has an absorption spectrum in um, basically the middle red section, and I'll show this in a second, uh, whereas PFR has far red. Again, I'll show this in a, section, in a second. But what's interesting to know is that in the dark, um, PR is inactive, um, and under red light, PFR becomes active, and then these switch back and forth depending on the combination of uh, red light and far red light, and that leads then to a cellular response, and that's basically, again, this shift here that's happening. So under red light, you get the shift going this way, and under far red light, you get a shift going back. So these, this one molecule will be shifting back and forth, whether it's exposed to red light or uh, far red light. And this is huge. This is so very huge. I mean, this, this reaction right here is basically, if, if we didn't have it, we wouldn't have life. Uh, this, is, this is immense to biology, all of biology, uh, other than maybe chemotrophs in the ocean. Like, this is huge. This, just this little reaction. All right, so here's that absorbance structure that I was saying we get to. So again, you can see PR has it cuts off at 700 nanometers, whereas PFR, although it has a little bump here around 660, it's mostly in that deep red that it's absorbing. So it's this difference in light between red and deep red that drives this, <clears throat> this ratio of whether it's PR or PFR. Now PR, this is what's inducing um, germination, um, whereas far red light suppresses germination. So what Hunt was seeing was actually far red light affecting that germination and um, allowing for flowering. Now there's a lot more that goes on with PR, PFR. So PFR, when you have PFR leading the situation, you have seed germination, um, you have shade of you have flowering, and then the same thing with PR, you've got these big differences, which I will show right now. Yeah, so it's more than just germination, stem elongation, leaf expansion, photosynthetic machinery development, flowering, dormancy, um, and even just brief exposure to red light at night can interrupt this dark period and prevent flowering in short day plants, um, while far red exposure can actually have the inverse effect. <coughs> Excuse me. So all of, all of this plant biology is coming down to this, these phytochrome pigments and which wavelengths of red are hitting them. And that will determine, yeah, germination or elongation, leaf expansion, all of these things. So this is huge, just these phytochromes alone. 
And of course that makes us start to think, well, if you have light at night, we know that a brief exposure to red light at night can interrupt the dark period. Well then having light pollution at night, that's clearly you know, hitting these, these trees and these plants um, could lead to huge ecological effects because uh, you're disrupting the primary producers of ecosystems. Um, all right, but that's just phytochromes. One other thing about phytochromes though, this is huge. And I don't mean to dwell on it too much, but phytochromes are big for st fighting stress in plants. One of the big stressors of plants right now is this tropospheric ozone, O3, <clears throat> which is produced by, you know, the usual stuff that we, we take for granted, like transportation, um, all different types of gases that we produce. It's all these, these reactive species of, of nitrogen and oxygen that basically poison plants. And one thing that helps a plant cope with this O3 is actually phytochromes. So phytochromes are able to reduce the um, oxygenation process from O3. And I, I believe that's correct. I could be wrong there. Let's see if it tells me here. But yeah, we do know all these impacts from O3 on plants, including reducing the photosynthesis, um, the ability for plants to actually sequester carbon, which clearly would be a problem, and it reduces the health and productivity of crops. So this is important because we'll come back to later a uh, study looking at O3 effects on plants in uh, under light pollution context. All right. So, and again, this phytochrome thing, this is during dark recovery. So this is under natural light, or sorry, natural dark with very little light. So this is really important. This, the fighting of phytochromes against O3 only happens when it is dark. Okay, what about cryptochromes? So these are the blue pigments, uh, or the blue photoreceptors, and originally they evolved from a molecule used for DNA repair, and it appears that they still do DNA repair in, in plants and also in, in animals. They're mostly uh, stem growth suppression and they do actually work with phytochromes. There's this communication with cryptochromes and phytochromes to regulate the circadian clock, right? Which is the photoperiodic uh, control of phenology. So this includes mostly in the case of plants is the control of flowering um, and also growth. All right, so cryptochromes are huge too. And remember, these are blue light. And this is important to keep in mind because once you start talking about artificial light at night, you'll notice that there's different sources that either basically are really rich in red or really rich in blue. So what's, what are you gonna be affecting? You're gonna be affecting the cryptochromes or you're gonna be affecting the uh, phytochromes. <clears throat> there's another, and I think these are the coolest. So there's phototropins, which also absorb blue light. And these are super cool. So the phototropism, seeking out light, which probably most of you already are aware what that is, but I found a cool little video. Let's see if it will play for us. So hi, let me know if it doesn't come through. Hopefully it does. It will load. It's working on it. Yeah, I don't know why it's taking so long. There we go, quick little instrumental break. Yeah. There we go. So anyway, you can see where the light is, um, right? So the light's over here right now. Through this is this time lapse video. Lights over here. Those oh, come on. And now they switch the light over here, and you have the plant just flowering on. That's kind of true. I think that one's just a little bit And now back over. Yeah. Super cool, right? Really, really cool. <laughs> How cool is that? So, uh, go away. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so that's, that's phototropism, and that's, that's all happening because of phototropins. So they're looking at the blue light, and they're driving the plant towards that. It's an actual behavior, right? These plants are moving towards blue light. They're just following it. It's not just controlling that behavior, though. It's also contrast controlling very important um, photosynthetic behaviors such as the chloroplast movements in response to changes in light levels. So the chloroplast will actually arrange in different directions based on how intense the light is. And the main reason is so that 
the photosynthetic machinery in the cell doesn't get fried if it's getting too hot or too too much light's bombarding it. So it will change a different direction. Also, if there's not much light, like it's in an understory, the chloroplast will actually line up um, orthogonal to direct light, right? So 90 degrees to make sure that they absorb as much light as possible so they can hopefully start growing up to get to more light. Um, this also controls leaf expansion and um, right, and also, yeah, I just read about this today, this stem elongation of dark grown uh, seedlings. So there's a lot going on with these three photoreceptors, right, or these photopigments in plants uh, that are just guiding so much of plant behavior. And then lastly, there's the FKF1, um, which is mostly involved with circadian clock. As far as I can tell, and again, I'm not a plant person. Um, I didn't even know FKF1 existed before looking into this for this talk. And it's mostly, yeah, for circadian clock, which means that it's, it, it's entrained by light, but then it regulates a regular clock within the plant, which is super, super cool. Um, there's probably other stuff that it also does. We just don't know yet. Or at least I just don't know yet. Okay. So why, why would plants have these red, far red, and blue light photoreceptors? Um, sunlight right, contains both red and far red components. And so when a plant is under direct sunlight, they'll have an equal mixture of both PR and PFR going out, right? Because they'll be going back and forth. When, it gets, when this PF gets hit by short red, it will then switch to PFR. But then that PFR will get hit by long red and will be driven back to PR. So you just, it's just constantly bouncing back and forth between these two um, isomers or two molecular, molecular shapes. Uh, so keep that in mind, right? In direct sunlight, you have this equal mixture. Um, chlorophyll absorbs mostly red light. So then plants in the understory, understory uh, dense leaves will not be getting red light, but will be getting far red light because chlorophyll doesn't absorb past 700 nanometers. So if you're under the forest canopy and you're a plant, you now know that you are being depleted of red light and you actually need to start growing fast and you need to seek out areas in that forest that will have more of that red light. This is where the, the blue photoreceptors are really helpful because they'll be able to cue in to patches in the canopy, right? That'll be blue light coming through. They can start to go there. Furthermore, having that um, long red or the, deep, the far red phytochrome, that will start growing way faster, right? Remember the far red phytochrome increases growth and stem elongation. So this is a super cool evolutionary effect that plants have from being able to determine if it's red or far red. I mean, they're, they're literally seeing the difference between red and far red. You know, not like we do with eyes, but with these photoreceptors. And that's a huge adaptation for them to be able to find sunlight where they'll be able to have more photosynthesis. Super cool. Very, very, very cool. Um, right, where I talked about how the chloroplasts themselves will uh, arrange differently based on light intensity. And yeah, and the phototropins open the stomata and this needs to happen. So phototropins, right, those are keying into blue light. Blue light, as we already saw from those different uh, daytime spectra, blue light's only really available in the environment during the day. And C3 and C4 plants, right, they have to open their stomata, which again, those holes in the cells that allow for gas exchange are so important for photosynthesis. They have to open when it's daytime. And so they're able to tell it's daytime because there's a lot of blue light. If there's not blue light, it's nighttime. This is very cool too. Uh, so, right, so phototropins also open the stomata. This is why plants need to be able to sense across the electrons electromagnetic spectrum. And in fact, most organisms, especially plants, fungi, and animals, need to be able to detect more or less some kind of color across the elect electromagnetic spectrum because it gives you more information than just knowing if it's dark or bright. Hopefully this all makes sense. Um, I found this super cool because I've focused so much on just animal vision, but to see that you know plants are using this huge adaptation to be able to determine, and it's in such a small area of the the visible spectrum just between red and far red that will lead them to basically succeed as a sapling or not. How cool. Very, very cool. I might have to just start uh, focus more on plants. This is really cool. All right. So there we have it. Those are the photopigments. 
uh, of plants that clearly you can see I'm going to tie this into light pollution because if you have different colors of light affecting or in the environment, they're going to be affecting these plants due to these photopigments. All right, let's introduce light pollution really quick. And you've got um, basically some, three different types of light pollution I want to talk about today. You have sky glow, you have direct light pollution, you have pulses. In this really nice video by National Geographic, we're, they're actually introducing a different scale for measuring light pollution. I'm not too worried about that. What I want you to focus on is just seeing like how you have these direct big bulbs of light sources. You have all these flashing lights from traffic, right? That are just going across the landscape. And then you also have this tint along the horizon that's called sky glow. Sky glow is due to direct light sources going up into the atmosphere and scattering all around, um, mostly by oxygen. And that's then kind of stuck up in the sky. And you have this constant light dome that will bring light back down onto the horizon and actually change or back down onto the surface of the earth and change the natural illumination on the ground. Furthermore, it also changes the celestial cues that you're able to use, whether you're a plant or animal, um, because there's gonna be part of the sky that has all of this, this scattered light. And it's really interesting to think about in plants because depending on how far away you are from a city, you could either have a red sky glow or you could have a blue sky glow. That's beyond the, the scope of this talk, but there is definitely a lot of potential there. I'm actually just thinking through it right now. Okay, so here we go, right? So this is a very bright city. And you can see the sky glow here. Oh, look at that blue sky glow right there. It's more red sky glow over here. Again, very bright sky glow. And you see all these transient pulses, right? Planes. Uh, cars along the horizon there. Anyway, so here you go, you have sky glow again, and then you have these direct light sources, and then you have this really awesome pulse. So keep that in mind, there's several different ways of having light pollution. And light pollution is becoming quite ubiquitous across the Earth's surface. More than 23% of the Earth's terrestrial surface um, cannot be seen by human observers, uh, cannot have the Milky Way seen by human observers due to light pollution. Um, so this map here, this is just showing the intensity of light being emitted from the surface up to satellites. So this is recorded by what's called the, the VIRS NASA satellite. And as you can see, most of the Eastern United States is inundated with light pollution. Most of Europe, especially Western Europe is inundated. Most of India, most of China, um, you know, the developed parts of Australia, the developed parts of South America, which is all coastal. And really, you know, if you're interested in, in oceanography and ecosystems, you'll notice that basically most coasts are completely bombarded with light pollution. Uh, whereas a lot of, Mainland areas are not. And in fact, Africa, and I know I'm being contradictory here, but you notice Africa is actually one of the areas that doesn't have very much light pollution. And this isn't due to like, you know, them having great ordinances or great education about light pollution. This is actually due to what's called lighting poverty. So they just don't have the resources to have light. And as China and other uh, countries are investing in Africa, the light pollution is actually growing substantially. So this in 20 years, if we aren't able to fight this, Africa is going to look a lot like um, Europe and Eastern America and the coastline of South America. Um, all right. So sky glow, again, this is luminous fog for about 23% of terrestrial Earth. 85% uh, of the United Kingdom is under it. 100% of the Netherlands is covered in sky glow. And 99% of both US and European populations live under this sky glow. Um, another thing to keep in mind, I couldn't, I didn't have enough time to find what it was for the US, but in Great Britain, 238,000 hectares of, what do I wanna say? Well, the verge, the road verge. So the land that's on either side of the street, right, or the road or whatever, the highway, um, are inundated with street lights, right? So 238,000 hectares are just inundated with street lights all night in Britain. And um, again, artificial light night, Alan. The other thing to keep in mind is that Alan comes, has many different components to it. It has the intensity, how bright the artificial light is, the spatial pattern, like where it's actually being thrown out, right? Is it on someone's barn going directionally in one way? Or is it more that sky glow that's kind of just basking the whole thing in this, this luminous fog? Um, 
And then furthermore, what's the spectrum of artificial light that's in the environment? Is it mostly red? Is it mostly blue? We'll talk about that in a second. Um, is it on all night or is it on just at certain times? Uh, so these are all things to keep in mind when you start thinking about Alan. All right. So I keep talking about like, oh yeah, you know, these different light sources are going to be affecting plants because plants have these different photoreceptors that are going to be affected um, by different colors of light. And street lights are not created equally depending on the type of light. Remember back to our different colors here. We have LEDs. Now, mind you, this figure is of about a 4,500 Kelvin LED. You can make LEDs all these different colors, but a common LED that a lot of people are buying and a lot of cities are installing are this 4,500 K LED. You'll notice that it's got this big blue peak here, and then it has most wavelengths of light. So there's a little dip in that like aqua section, but otherwise it's pretty, it's pretty white with a little blue tint, as you can see here. Then we have the older lighting technology, high pressure sodium, which is mostly being cleared out by LEDs. The high pressure sodium is not as energy effective. LEDs are way better for um, energy consumption and needing to be replaced. I mean, LEDs are a fantastic technology. They are the solution to light pollution. It's just sometimes people use them incorrectly and the wrong colors, and that can be a huge problem. Uh, but high pressure sodium, notice high pressure sodium right, has a lot of red and orange light, and it includes some of that deep red light as well, far red light. Again, that's a new term for me, far red. Animals can't see far red. We don't have the thermal dynamics to actually perceive it. So this far red idea of plants is just so cool. Um, all right, the metal halides, which are mostly in industrial uh, factories, industrial places, buildings. Uh, you'll have these big metal halides, which are very peaky, and they're more or less white light with a little bit of a yellow hint. Okay, so these are just three of many different types of light sources. Again, you can have many different colors of LEDs. We also have low pressure sodium. You can have neon lights. You can have mercury vapor, all these different types of lights. And all of these are contributing to light pollution. All right. And I also want to talk now quickly about the intensity. So depending on how far away you are from a street light, you have very different, uh, level, very different levels in the amount of light, of course, right? Because light is, is attenuating by the square law. So what, the, just what that means is as you go further and further away, you're dropping basically uh, the square of that number, right? So 30 to 8 to 2. And the other thing I want to talk about is, again, all these light levels are so important. Up here, we have those natural light levels that plants and animals care about, daylight being very bright, twilight, moonlight, and then starlight being very dark. Again, this is a billion times different down here on the x-axis. And then we have, look at all of these different types of light pollution that are completely masking these natural cycles here. Right? If you have car headlights constantly along a road verge, you're not going to know whether, especially for your plant, whether it's daylight, twilight, moonlight, or starlight. Um, and the same thing, yeah, for the, again, grass verge, street lighting there, you have this huge order of magnitudes of light just due to light pollution. Okay, so now we're through Alan. I hope that I've shown you that Alan is in most places terrestrially. Um, other than those, you know, very dark areas in Africa and, you know, um, the outback and the Amazon. But most areas, especially where your garden is, it has light pollution. And is there anything going on with artificial light at night and plants? And although most biological research is really focused on the effects on animals, um, there are a few cases of plant research really showing interesting and relatively scary things. This first photo on the left here is absolutely fantastic. And I missed it at first because I'm red-green colorblind. So if you're red-green colorblind, um, I put this blue circle here to help you see, and hopefully you can perceive this. But in the middle here, these are green leaves and everything else is orange or yellow. And you also notice that there's a street light right here. So this street light is illuminating these specific leaves. They're not changing it because they think, oh, photo period's still really long. We don't need to change it. And you can also see here that these leaves on the right side, all these leaves have already dropped and these are still holding on. And there's that light source right there. So a lot of trees are doing this where parts of their, uh, you know, parts of their self, I guess, 
are thinking, oh, it's, you know, it's time to drop. And others are saying, no, 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 the photo period is so really long. So you have this weird fight within itself of when it should actually drop leaves. And you guys probably have all, you probably have seen this because you're looking for this. Uh, you probably have noticed this around your house. There are several different species of trees that do this. I think there's about nine in the United States that have been shown to do it. So what is going on? What are the possible consequences? Well, remember all those different things that are controlled by photoreceptors, growth, development, stress control, uh, phototropism, the leaf color, abscission or leaf drop, circadian rhythms, bud burst, et cetera, even like fighting off insect herbivory, all these things, stress to pollution, all of these things could be affected by artificial light at night because dark is a resource. Dark is a resource for animals and plants and fungi. It's natural and it's a resource. If you take that away to artificial light at night, there's probably gonna be consequences. All right, so first, some problems with uh, connecting light pollution research and botany. Well, this is how most light pollution experts study it over here in this. This is their equipment and look at the absorbance spectra. They basically measure between 400 and 700 because that's what the human visual system sees with a peak. So this is basically what we'll call, it's called the uh, photopic system or photometric approach. And this is based on the human visual system. And you've got this peak around 550. Now, if you want to study PR and PFR, you think that Lux is gonna be very helpful? No, so this is a big problem. Um, and again, it's because astronomers have really been the ones to fight and push for light pollution research. And because of that, um, they're biased towards their own visual system. And there's nothing wrong with that other than now, a lot of these data we can't really apply to PR and PFR. Um, you can luckily measure the full spectrum of light at night, and then we can overlay that onto the different pigments. And that's what needs to be done in plant research. And very little research has done that. Um, but so in these figures over here on the right, you have uh, daylight is this gray light, and then you've got this black light, which is either an LED or high pressure sodium. I don't actually know if this is, and I'm blocking it, so I can't see that. But it looks like a, either a mercury vapor or metal halide. Um, I hope that's what it should be, one of those. And then, yeah, sodium low pressure rays, this red peak here. Let's see. Also, notice that the this here is the, I believe this is the reflectance spectrum of of chlorophyll. Okay, let's see. Yeah, down here, this is the photosynthetic active radiation, this black line, meaning these are the wavelengths of light that are absorbed in photosynthesis. And then the, these two, the dotted and the gray line, those are the different visual systems of humans, whether it's the um, night vision or day vision, basically. Just notice how very different these are. These are so narrow, the human visual system is so narrow. Uh, compared to the very broad photosynthetic range. And then over here, we have again our PR and PFR, uh, phytochrome photoreceptors, and also this area is where cryptochrome is. So this is just, just keeping this in mind that you have these different light sources that are overlapping here. And then again, the human visual system uh, is a poor surrogate for understanding photosynthetic active radiation along with these other photopigments that are used for plant growth and development. Now, what one study has done is they actually looked at how much um, of an effect these different spectra will have on uh, these different photoreceptors. So this right here, this is, I forget what, I had this in my notes, but I can't see them. But this is phytometric something. And it's basically how much, oh no, this is, it's the ratio, that's right. So this is the ratio between uh, PF and PFR. And so naturally you have, a, in sunlight, you have a ratio of about 0.7 You'll, and shade is much lower, which I was talking about, right? Uh, Cause you have that deep, that deep red will be driven and PFR will be, uh, PF will be much lower. Whereas under all these artificial light sources, you notice they're way higher than what would happen under sunlight and shade. So plants at night are going to have a completely different ratio of PR to PFR. And then the relative absorbance um, based on photosynthetic active radiation, look at how different those are based on the indirect, or sorry, the light sources that are unnatural versus uh, sunlight. Okay, so hopefully that shows that 
theoretically, we should have big problems because these artificial light sources are not, mat are not doing what sunlight should be doing. And furthermore, sunlight's during the day, plants need night. And so these, these um, artificial light sources are gonna be bombarding these plants at night with more PSS than sunlight. Okay, so we're gonna quickly go through some changes um, that have happened to plants. So changes in phenology, bud burst in the UK. What this map shows is first uh, temperature and then light pollution. These scientists out of Exeter, what they looked at were four different species of trees and when the tree would have a bud burst. They used satellite images. This is super cool stuff. And they were able to overlay that with light pollution and temperature and to see if light, if trees that were in more light polluted areas would have an earlier bud burst. And in fact, that's what they found. So they found that beech, oak, and ash all had earlier bud burst up to 14 days earlier uh, based on exposure to light pollution. And that's what this figure shows here. This is a weird figure on how they show it, but you have brighter light over here and then later days of bud burst. So this is like the, the normal time would be around 11th, 13th of April. And in fact, a lot of them under very bright conditions are almost two weeks earlier. So trees uh, have bud burst much earlier. And this was over 20 years or 14 years. Uh, yeah, 14 years. It was over 14 years that they did this study. All right, and I already started to show you these different changes in autumn colors and abscission. Uh, and again, this is just more examples. Very few research studies have actually quantified this well. It's tough for them to do. They have to have a lot of people going out and doing it. This would be a really good citizen science project. Um, but there are tons of anecdotal, I guess I should just say anecdotes, of the effects of light pollution on certain species of trees not dropping their leaves under direct artificial light. All right, and in New Zealand, in their, the Christmas tree, uh, it's been found that these, these plants actually have way more flowers if they're under a street light than if they're in between street lights. So this is also affecting the flowering plants, just based on you know, whether you're 10 feet or 100 feet from a street light. And then uh, Greater Bird's, Bird's Foot in the UK, they had 25% fewer flower heads under Allen. So this is also showing that it depends on the species, whether you're a tree or a flower, what kind of uh, plant you are, you'll have different effects. But this Greater Bird's Foot has fewer flowers under um, under artificial or under yeah under artificial light. Now the, the main reason though is because it's actually changing the composition of the community. So under um, different as you can see here, bitrophic and trophic. That means that you've got here you have one of their pests that eat the, the plant, and then here you have a predator that eats the pest that eats them. Uh, so this is it starts to get pretty complicated with the ecology of whether you have if it's just plants or whether you have some of the critters involved. All right, I'm gonna to try to run through a lot of this. This is a very cool anecdote, this is crazy. So one of these authors that studies the effects of light pollution on plants has a friend who works at a prison and this friend told him that the soy grown within 30 meters of this prison in Ohio uh, grows really, really fast and then there are no beans. So <laughs> the soy is just a 30 meter basically dry zone and it's due to all this light coming from the, the prison. And then there's another case of this in Ghana, where there were all these maize crops, corn, right, along a street, and it had always been really productive. And then they, they installed high pressure sodium lights right next to this field. And the crop within, I think it was about 50 meters, didn't produce any maize, just aborted the fruit. Um, whereas the rest of the field did have the fruit. All right, effects on photosynthesis. There's this amazing study by Raven and Cockle in 2006 that's it's actually in the Journal of Astrobiology. And they did all of these different mathematical computations to see if celestial bodies alone could affect photosynthesis. And then they, they took it at a whole other level. They were trying to figure out like how many stars you'd need in the universe to make it so that photosynthesis could happen without a sun condition. And the idea was to see like, you know, what, what planets could have photosynthesis even without our kind of sun. However, so that's probably not being affected by light pollution so much. Um, however, caves have been shown because you have these, this algae and mosses 
that will come in and um, what's what I'm looking for? Set up camp there under the light sources for you know foot traffic. So national parks need to be very very careful about how they use light in caves. And I will say that the United States National Park Service is really good about this. Right, those lights are only on uh, when people are in there and they shut off immediately. Whereas I've been to caves in China, they just leave the lights on all the time. And there's tons of plant life. And there's plant life in the underwater pools in these caves too. Um, so this is, this is a big effect. This is changing the plant composition of caves, which are really should be plants. An interesting study in plankton, right, which are these tiny little um, photosynthetic singer celled organisms that are aquatic or marine, um, under six lux, so this is, this is pretty dark, this is twilight levels, um, decrease both chlorophyll A concentration and they increase the number of rubisco, or they decrease the number of rubisco molecules. Remember that rubisco is also very important for photosynthesis. Um, another possibility, there's some evidence that artificial light at night affects the stomatal density uh, and stomatal opening. And remember that those are those little pores on the, the leaf that allow for photosynthesis to have gas exchange. All right, now I talked about this O3, right? The tropospheric ozone. And that's because there's one really interesting study in clovers that when they were under um, light pollution and exposed to O3, they did terribly. They couldn't fight off O3 pollution at all. They had terrible, terrible damage. Um, this is not actually showing the damage. It's the only really nice figure I could show of clovers. Um, so this is a double whammy of pollution because you have air pollution and light pollution. So this is a really big problem as we create more and more O3 and more light pollution, these plants are not going to be able to fight it off. Remember this disrupts the phytochrome uh, mechanisms, phytochrome pathways. All right, and then some quick other points. Um, Allen results in plants susceptible to frost damage. Uh, there's a couple studies showing that yeah, they're, they're more likely to have frost damage because they, they're not prepared, right? The photo period they think is still very long. Also, they're more likely to have fungal pathogens. This has to do with the phytochrome being able to fight off um, parasites and then more likely to have um, herbivory on them. Uh, an interesting study in the 70s looked at ornamental garden plants under high pressure sodium and found that there were huge differences in growth rates. So it depended on the, which species, whether it would grow more or flower more or grow less or flower less. And then a really great study in 2016 looked at grassland communities and found that under different colors of artificial light, you'd have different plant communities. Uh, so that's big. So based on what kind of street lights we're putting you know, through these prairies, you could have very different communities of grasses and plants. All right, let's talk about insects really quick. Um, luckily, we're almost there. So, and really, yeah, plants and animals are really gonna talk about insects. That's what I mostly focus on. Um, and it's mostly about pollinators, right? So we have a butterfly, and that's not a bee, that is a hoverfly. All right, the insect apocalypse. So we're gonna switch for a second here. I'm gonna talk about how insects are declining. So globally, we know that about 20% of dragonflies are declining, 30% of butterfly populations are declining, 45% of ants, bees, and wasps are declining, 60% of beetles are declining, 100% grasshopper populations studied are declining, and that's a lot of biomass that's going down, 2% annual decline in biomass. Why do we care? You guys are gardeners. You should know, and I assume you do, that how important insects are. Insect apocalypse really means the apocalypse for all, and it definitely means the apocalypse for flower and plants, because insects pollinate 80% um, of the flowering plants. Furthermore, they're responsible for about 75% of the crop species pollination. So that's, that's very important for gardeners, right? You get it, your flowers and your, your food plants are gonna be in, in serious trouble if you don't have those insect pollinators. Also for gardeners, right? We know that you can use insects to control other pests. Uh, they might be eating those plants that you want, right? So ladybird beetles or ladybugs, as we call them here, will eat a lot of those aphids and other things that will be destroying your plants. Of course, probably a lot of you also enjoy the different vertebrates that come to your garden or that you see in your backyard, and most of them are eating insects. And then lastly, uh, insects break down waste, right, and decaying matter. They're huge. They are a waste management. Without them, we would just be piled in uh, death and feces. So very, very important. But again, you guys get it because 
you understand the importance of pollination and pest control, native pest control, so you don't have to be spraying all these toxins all over your plants. Light pollution clearly affects insects. I was involved in this, this paper that was published uh, last fall, uh, talking about how light pollution is a driver of insect declines. We show that over 200 studies show impacts of light pollution on insect populations and all these different mechanisms uh, in ways that light pollution affects insects, such as moths being attracted to street lights where they're more likely to be eaten by bats, um, beetles not flashing under direct light, and other species of beetles actually being attracted to specific lights thinking that it is a female flashing. Uh, West Nile virus and mosquitoes goes up under artificial light. Uh, we know that a lot of predators will come into direct light sources to eat these insects. Different crickets actually will go away from lights so that you have huge areas along street lights or along streets that don't have their native insect fauna because the animals have left, right? They have this anti-phototaxis. Uh, all right, photophobia. And then of course, there's all these different effects with herbivory and pollination. All right, so plant and pollination, uh, both diurnal and nocturnal, super important for plant health and for ecosystem health, right? Especially for diversity. You start removing these diverse pollinators, you won't have your diverse plants, and that's a big problem. Most conservation focuses on diurnal pollinators, right? Your bees uh, and your butterflies. But moths are also a huge pollinator for plants huge pollinator um, and so are bats and these nocturnal pollinators are affected by light pollution and so alan disrupts the physiology of numerous nocturnal pollinators mo uh, mostly moths here that i'm talking about but um, the cabbage moth has male caterpillars they decrease um, the pupil mats right which is when they're in that little pupa and then also the size of the pupa which then leads to them not being able to reproduce um, let's see is that's the winter moth decreases activity in mating and then also yeah so winter moths uh, decrease activity in mating and then also have asynchrony with the host meaning that they will actually start to come out before oak their host plant has leaves so they'll come out and they'll starve to death because the plant yet hasn't doesn't have the leaves so they're again queuing into the photo period and the plant is not changing they're changing they have no food. Um, right, so street lighting also increases local aggregations of predatory invertebrates. So you notice here, this is dark bars are control, meaning no light at night, and then the light bars are pollution. And you notice that predators are way more uh, present under light pollution, and scavengers as well. But grazers, uh, detrivores, they are less likely to be under light pollution. So artificial light is disrupting the amount of predators and the things that eat the plant, um, which will have a big effect on the ecosystem surrounding the plant. Lastly, uh, non-insect pollinators under Allen. We know that bats in tropical regions are the main long distance pollen and seed dispersers. And these type of plant, these type of bats actually have, um, they're photophobic. So light is very much a big barrier for them. So they are less likely to be carrying pollen and dispersing seeds to far areas. So this could be big for uh, affecting plant distribution, tree distribution in the tropics. Okay, so hopefully I've um, got you on board that there is light pollution, that light pollution affects the physiology of plants and therefore the ecology of plants due to these different photoreceptors in plants and that animals too are also affected and the interaction between plants and animals is affected by artificial light at night. So the only thing that we really have left to talk about is, well, how are we gonna solve this problem? Light pollution is relatively easy because all you have to do is just get the light gone. You don't have to go clean it up, right? Just turn off the light, it's gone. It's not coming back. Um, unlike ozone, pollution, all these other things you have to clean up or toxins in the river, you have to go and clean up. And then where do you put it? Light's just gone, right? It just gets absorbed, it's done. So if we can get everyone just to be better about lighting, will have very few effects uh, from Allen on plants and insects. And that's great. Your gardens will be healthier. Everything will be better if we are um, more light pollution savvy. So there are three axes of solutions when it comes to light pollution spatially, right? And this is, I, this is something I really, you know, I, I, I encourage you to go to IDA's website and look and audit your own house. Like what kind of light pollution are you contributing to your backyard, to your garden? Um, are you controlling it spatially? Do you have 
light bulbs that are just sending light everywhere? Or do you have full cutoff filters that are only putting the light right in front of your door where you need it, right? Or right where your car is. That's, that's good lighting. You can also um, change it temporally, right? You only, you only need light when you're there. So, so many people that have light on their, you know, their backyards and they're not outside, that's silly. There's no reason for it. We know that it doesn't change uh, the effects of criminals coming into your house. In fact, really poor lighting does. So if you have a floodlight that creates a lot of shadows around you, your yard, uh, criminals are more likely to use those shadows to be hidden from you. So it's better to just, and of course, if you have it on a motion activated detector, as soon as someone kicks that, the light comes on. They're given like, that's, that's way better than just having a light on all the time. Um, and then spectrally, right? We talked about this. Now, with understanding plants and animals together, it's difficult to say which spectra is better. Most research is focused on, on animals. So it's easy to say, oh, use red light because that has less effect on animals. However, it seems like this red light can have a big effect on plants. So we need to kind of go back to the drawing board and see what we can do there. Although we could, with LEDs, you could change the ratio between the red and deep red to not really affect animals and not affect plants. Anyway, uh, something to think about <clears throat> once I end here and have a beer. All right, well, thank you so much for um, spending your, your evening with me. Sorry for going over a little bit, and hopefully you had um, some entertaining time. Thanks. Okay, we have a couple questions. All right. Uh, someone made the comment, four hours of daylight in winter, or actually they asked the question. Did you mention that? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So in that figure, um, sure. So this is just talking, why can't I? Let's see, I can't go back, so I'm gonna have to end this. Okay. Uh, where is it? Right, so that's just saying if you're 60 degrees north, and then let's, if we're here inside. Yeah, so if you're at 60 degrees north during the winter, there's only four hours of daylight. Just like during the summer, there's 20 hours of daylight. Uh, in the far north. And that has to do with, again, the, the tilt of the axis. Um, now, of course, you know, in Missouri, which we're in between, you know, we're right around 30 degrees, um, we would have only a difference between 14 during the summer and nine during the winter. But if you go all the way to the pole, right, at, during winter, if you're on the North Pole, you have no light. And then during the summer, you have 24 hours of light. Hopefully that answers that question. Okay. And another one, uh, what effect has this past spring had on plants and insects with people around the world being confined to their homes? Right. We don't have, well, if you're asking about artificial light at night, we don't have those data yet. So the satellite data um, are currently being processed and everything. We'll actually see if light pollution has gone down due to the global economic um, recession. Um, but at the same time, maybe light pollution has gone up because more people are home. Stuff no, we're going to find out a lot about that. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the regular monitoring of insect populations, a lot of that stuff's kind of put on hold. A lot of researchers aren't oh, allowed to go right. to their facilities, right, and measure this stuff. So a lot of that information is going to be lost uh, because a lot of the collections have to be done by people. It's not something we can just do remotely, and a lot of academic institutions uh, have shut those down. So. I don't know what we're going to be able to learn. Hopefully people are, I mean, I still go to my research station um, and get special approval for it. Hopefully people are still doing it. The answer is, I don't know. Um, I'm very excited to find out like what we are able to actually measure. Don't know yet. Okay. Is there anything we can do about too much commercial lighting and public street lighting? Yeah, right. There is. So one thing is talk to those Companies, talk to those corporations, tell them that, uh, you know, you don't appreciate it, especially like light at night, especially blue light. I mean, this is not only bad for plants and, and non-human animals, it's also bad for humans. Uh, so you talk to them. We, unfortunately, we haven't really, what's the word I'm looking for, gotten together yet to work with legislation um, at, you know, at a state or federal level. And that's, that's really what we need to be doing. Uh, we need to, and IDA, you know, is trying to do this. Um, but that's something that can be done is working with 
entities like IDA or Zoological Lighting Institute to get the message across and lobby for changes. Um, and it's, it's a big fight because there are societies of engineers that want more light and they want blue light. They want to create daytime all the time. Uh, so it is, it's going to be an uphill battle. At the end of the day, I think the data speak for themselves. Um, but yeah, you just need to talk to these corporations that have these lights on and say, you know, why are you doing it? And they'll save money, right? They're paying electricity for these lights that, that aren't needed. Haven't there been studies like in New York City, sleep studies about they have such disrupted sleep because lights are constantly coming through the curtains. They're on all the time. Yeah, there are a lot of health consequences um, to sleep to what disrupting sleep cycle, to creating artificial jet lag, um, issues with uh, retinas. There's a lot of retinal disorders, a lot of you know, effects of blue light, which a lot of LEDs are, they have a lot of blue light, so there's an effect. Um, sorry that I have really nice natural lighting right now. It's just that my computer's not picking it up. So <laughs> I'm not, I'm not gonna That's it. okay. <laughs> um, what else? Uh, oh, obesity. So we know that what's happening at the human level is we detect the difference between blue light and not blue light. And if there's blue light, it's daytime. If there's not blue light, it's nighttime. And so our body changes a lot of our physiology, right? We lose our appetite. We start to get sleepy. When you have blue light from street lights or from TVs or from cell phones uh, that are always on, you never shut down. You don't ever change your appetite, so you're always hungry. We know that people gain weight when they're exposed to blue light because they still have appetite. Uh, and so many people are trying all these different diet fads. One thing that could really help, just shave a couple pounds, is don't look at blue light, right? Change your uh, phone to have a red filter on at night. You'll be amazed. Oh, come on. Yeah, I'm serious. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. I mean, research out of Harvard, research out of <laughs> UCLA, like it's these things. But people don't want to listen to it, right? They want to look at their phone up in blue mode for some reason when they're in bed. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of research out there. Okay, I mean, that was totally oh, worth your talk, Brett. Yeah, <laughs> great. <laughs> great. Uh, um, was and awesome. There was another question about entomologist um, Doug Tallamy has said that yellow LED would be the best choice for porch lights. Do you agree? As an entomologist, I do agree. Okay. Um, with the exception that there are still insects that are attracted to yellow light. The best color of a porch light is one that's off, right? Okay. Like, or shielded. Um, and then yeah, okay. yellow light would, would, would be the best. However, you're going to be, what, what are people really excited about when they're on their porch at night? Well, they're excited about lightning bugs, right? Or fireflies, depending on where you are in the, the world. Um, yellow light does affect firefly flashing, firefly flashing. We know that. So I would say, you know, unless you're reading out there on your porch, you don't, what, what do you need a light on for? Use, you know, use a candlelight that's, that's covered. Um, yeah, I, yellow is the best, but I'm not saying that's what everyone should, no, you shouldn't be using anything. Great, that's it. A lot of people saying thank you, they love to talk. And, and I do wanna thank you, Brett. Excellent. Well, I had very fun. enjoyable. Yeah, it was fun for me to do this research. I learned a lot. Like I didn't know any of this. So did we. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. See you next week.